Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure. Philippe Dumas, the surgeon of EJEC and uh, the project coordinator of the John Deere project to welcome you to this uh, webinar on licensing, uh, permitting uh, for deep geothermal project with environmental barriers. We will start in two minutes. We are still waiting some people to connect. We had around 200 people registered today, so we start in one to two minutes. Thank you for your energy. Okay, good morning again. So welcome again to this uh, workshop. You will see we're organizing today a webinar for two hours to discuss how to overcome the barriers about licensing, permitting, especially looking at the environmental aspects for deep geothermal project. And you will see we have a great speakers and a good uh, panelists in this uh, round table we organize. So I hope it will be really interesting for you to follow us for the next two hours. Um, you see that we organize today this event, but also be informed and save a date. Uh, we are also every week for the next uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks organizing different topics about deep geothermal in the framework of the JNV project. Next week it will be about air quality, and after we continue with some other technical issues. Uh, we also have a high-level policy event on the 23rd of March, and we conclude on 13th of April on LC and sustainable finance. So mark your calendar. I think the invitation is about to be sent also if you want to register to these um, webinars. It's always uh, Tuesday morning, so except one, the 18th of March, which is a Thursday, uh, 10 o'clock uh, Central Europe time. I will just brief you today about uh, what is GNV, but it's really a short presentation because after that, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Peter Valkering from Vito. Uh, he was in charge of the recommendation provided by the different partners in the project regarding licensing and uh, environmental impact assessment. Um, and following this recommendation from GNV, we want to receive also your feedback. So today we are a bit in a consultation round with you to also receive really your ideas and your comments on what we are proposing to you. For that, we have two sessions. First, presentation, notably to see a panorama of the national uh, regulament, regulations. So we have an overview of different project licensing. And secondly, we have a round table on how we can all work to facilitate uh, the development of project, but also respecting environmental concerns. You see that uh, the round table will consider Italy, France, Hungary, and uh, in Belgium, Flanders, uh, Flanders uh, for the session one. So we'll have a presentation on these four case studies. And secondly, we have a round table with um, different panelists from the four uh, case studies, but also we have Romani from Turkey, from Iceland. Uh, to complete that, and Thomas Garbetin from EJEC to present also the European, European Directive on, on, on this topic. 
What is about GNV? Briefly, it's a project targeting six countries, but aiming at drafting some recommendation valid for all the rest of Europe. So today, also, if you're not coming from Iceland, France, Belgium, Italy, Hungary, or Turkey, you're also welcome because we want also to exchange with you the recommendations we provide. We started, it was at the start of the project in 2018, 2019, to map a bit the environmental matters, and you have different uh, reports available online on the GNV website, notably a database. We just ended recently uh, the LCA methodology. Uh, it's available with different reports and with a tool available online. I don't go too much to the detail here because I mentioned there's a specific workshop on this topic later in March. And here we are in this idea of engaging with decision makers on the decision making process. Report on policy and regulation is published. Recently, we have just formulated the recommendations, the first draft recommendations. And today, as I say, it's a round of consultation for improving our recommendations. And we will um, end with a strategy uh, a, bit, a bit later, once we have received all your comments. Um, last but not least, we also want to promote the LCA uh, methodology drafted in GNV, and for that we have organized different events, notably last week, uh, to promote the tool, and you have an online web-based platform for stakeholders, some improvements are also currently done, and all that will be finally uh, ready um, later, later, probably next month in, in March. Uh, so I really recommend you to visit our website. You see that you have a lot of uh, uh, information reports, but also two tools, uh, environmental database and the simplified life cycle assessment tool. And you can find here several information. As I say, maybe to conclude, our GNV project ends uh, on 31st of April, so in a bit two months. If you have urgent recommendation comments on the website, on the report, on the recommendation we give today, please forward them to us as soon as possible. With that, I end my uh, introduction and I immediately give the floor to Peter Valkering from Vito to deliver the recommendation from the GNV project. I hope you will enjoy this webinar and uh, see you later for the round table. Peter, floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> See, must I share my screen myself? There we go. Can you please confirm that my presentation is on screen? Yes, thank you very much. So my name is Peter Valkering from Vito Indeed. I was uh, coordinating work package four, um, which is about uh, not only licensing, but in general <clears throat> environmental regulations to address environmental concerns uh, for deep geothermal. So uh, I really want to highlight also, uh, it was really a collective effort. So all the contributions of the partners, in particular, all the national leads working in the different GeoNV case study. So the ambition of, of Work Package 4, um, basically in, 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 in three points, it's to map and analyze the, the status of uh, environmental regulations in our, in our case study countries. Uh, based on that, uh, to, to develop recommendations for the uh, improved regulatory practice uh, to, to address environmental concerns. And uh, very importantly, not to do that on, on our own, but to engage with uh, decision makers and stakeholders uh, in, 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 do, in helping us with that and getting uh, ample feedback along the way. Um, so this is... Uh, the, the the approach that we have been taking. Uh, so uh, to give you uh, an idea where how we arrived at the recommendations we are uh, presenting uh, today. Uh, so we started with uh, with a mapping stage, um, which you can find more about in our deliverable uh, 4.1, which is on the website. Uh, from that, uh, <clears throat> we we went to the recommendation phase, which which also we have a working paper. Our recommendations on the European level and the compilation of the recommendations, which are reports that you can already find uh, on the uh, on the website. Now, very importantly, we had a stakeholder engagement process running in parallel. So the, the early start was was to inform stakeholders, but not only informing; it was really to understand better what are the key issues where uh, additional um, say recommendations are needed. 
so it was also really a scoping exercise. We had a, a workshops on barriers and solutions uh, <clears throat> that were uh, meant to really go into um, the rec draft recommendations developed and to, to get feedback on that. And now we're at the third stage, um, uh, actions, which is, if it's popping up, there we go, uh, what we are doing today. So the last thing to mention here is that we did the informing and the barrier solution stage. We always did it on a national level. So we've been engaging in national level workshops uh, in our different countries. And for the last stage, we thought it would be interesting to, to take it up to a European level also to give like a momentum to this idea of uh, sharing and transferring good practices uh, among countries. Let's see if I can move on. So to give an overview of our recommendations. So uh, as I said, um, uh, we, we zoomed in on, on a number of uh, what we find particularly relevant topics. Uh, we identified <clears throat> two main categories, uh, the, the technical topics that you see on the left-hand side and the more process topics that you see uh, on the right hand side um, so for each of them we have um, we have analyzed uh, how this is organized in the different countries and did a, a, a comparison and based on that uh, developed our recommendations so today the main or the, the topic we are addressing is uh, the, the, the ones of complex licensing and delays in environmental impact assessment and as uh, Philippe already mentioned uh, we have other dedicated sessions for the different topics uh, so as to go more in depth. So this is only one part of our uh, recommendations. And also I would like to mention that the uh, information and the feedback we, we are uh, obtaining from this workshop will be used to draft uh, policy briefs uh, as a main uh, output of, of the project for each of the different topics addressed in, in, in the workshops. Okay, so let's get straight to the recommendations. Um, I just summarized for, for each of the two topics what we found as main challenges and then how that translates to the uh, recommendations. Um, so for licensing, our main kind of question was, uh, I mean, understandably licensing and environmental permitting, these are all very important processes. Uh, at the same time, uh, they can be rather complex and time consuming. So we have been looking to the question, how to improve that? Does that need to be improved? So our findings uh, were uh, basically that if you go to all the different countries, you see on, on the one hand, a relative similar approach uh, in, in a way, in the sense that, well, there's a rough uh, distinction between exploration, exploitation, which you see uh, back in, in each country. and yeah, overall, there are similarities, but if you look into the details, actually, all the procedures are are, are are different. So there are various specific procedures and timings, but it sort of follows the same rationale in most of the countries. Um, however, uh, we have been looking into what then causes uh, main delays, and there the, the following topics pop up. So <clears throat> one thing is a lack of centralized management. Actually, there is an interesting case of uh, how it is organized in Iceland where um, where it is much more of a, a, a one-stop shop or a single actor um, being in, in charge of the, the permitting processes. And if that is not the case, there is this communication between different uh, permitting process actors that may slow down uh, procedures. Um, environmental impact assessment that is, tends to be identified as, as a factor that, that say causes most of the of the delays um, in relation to the timings that are, say, uh, the theoretical timings that are listed as as the as the norm. Um, also, the sometimes the lack of expertise at the side of authorities can cause uh, additional uh, time. Um, there are a variety of procedural complexities. Um, for example, when multiple projects are in the vicinity. Uh, when uh, environmental impact assessment needs to be performed at multiple stages uh, or when simply some forms are, are very complex. And finally, there are uh, financial adequacy issues, which is mostly a topic um, to be encountered in Turkey, where the uh, actual um, 
the, 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 the parties requesting the license are not tested sufficiently on financial uh, their financial adequacy. So that leads to the following recommendations. Uh, organizing the permitting processes more as a one-stop shop. Uh, again, uh, the, the example that we then take is, is the one of Orkos Tovnun in, in Iceland, the National Energy Authority there, which, which is in charge of the, um, say, the full process from, from exploration to, to exploitation. Um, we think it's important to, to develop a best practice guide for the different actors involved um, to really show what are the, the, the steps uh, in the process uh, to, to take. Um, we, we have this ensuring the appropriate competences and, and skills at the side of the authorities and finally the uh, check of financial adequacy in, in licensing procedures. We go down to the topic of environmental impact assessments. Um, so there we started off with the uh, question of um, whether it would be possible be, because all the, the deep geothermal projects have say their own approach, their own context, their own geological specificities and so on. At the, at the same time that we, we felt like a need for more uh, transparent and clear guidance on how to do an EIA. So we, we kind of started with that idea, <clears throat> to what extent is it possible to, to come up with, it, with a clear guidance, which is still uh, uh, allows the flexibility to, to, to deal with different specificities of the different types of projects. So what we find, found out is that um, in, environmental impact procedures are, tend to be quite generic across uh, countries following the, the, the basic EU legislation on that topic. Uh, we've been looking into specific uh, national guidelines um, where we have found uh, general guidance uh, for sure, but but less so that are kind of tailored to deep geothermal specificities. Um, so if you look at uh, things like which types of impacts to include, we, what, what are the thresholds to be considered for those impacts? Again, it's often related to, to general uh, regulations and laws on emissions or water quality and so on. Um, and there are no clear prescriptions for, for mitigation measures. Uh, and, and the final topic was was the um, the role of the exemptions. So, uh, although in principle the exemptions can be granted, it's not always clear. Uh, well, how to say the the requirements for for reaching an exemptions are considered quite strong. So that leads to a similar effort basically to get an exemption compared to actually doing the full uh, EIA. So these were the challenges en encountered. That would lead to the following recommendations. So drafting a more dedicated EIA guideline for deep geothermal, um, making clear what the scope is in relation to the project and the ge geological context, um, provide more clarity on the, the whole process of the EIA and the permitting, uh, and uh, clarify more these procedures for exemption. Uh, a second one is that it would be very useful to have more flexibility in this process. Um, that also really really relates to the topic of uncertainty. So in the exploration phase, uh, a lot of things are still unknown. Um, so it, it could be an idea to work towards a kind of a, a, a more formalized process where there are uh, updates that can be um, done over the course of project as, as further knowledge becomes available. Um, and and something in a similar situation that we could that we could go for simplified procedures in the case of modifications of already existing permits. Um, again, here the topic of competences and skills at the side of the authorities comes back, and finally the uh, def defining also best available technologies for for deep geothermal, for example, as part of that guidance would be uh, would be a useful add on. We think. So uh, if you look at these, um, what already exists, we, we came with a, a first overview of, of, of some documents that we found on specific guidance. Um, again, there is on the, on the generic level, there is quite a lot, but if you go to the, what is specific for deep geothermal, uh, it is rather limited and we think we can improve on that. So there are some things interesting um, 
kind of good practice guides and so on for, for deep geothermal drilling, for example. Uh, but we think we can uh, expand on that. Okay, that was the, um, the, the presentation from my side. Uh, to give you an overview of the recommendations um, on complex licensing and um, environmental impact assessment. Uh, as Philippe already mentioned, uh, we are really looking forward also to your feedback. So typically we would like to know uh, what are the main takeaways um, for you, what, what is really applicable in, in your countries and so on, and also how what, what kind of next steps could, could we take based on these uh, results. So we think that the, this topic of, uh, of better guidance is it's uh, it's very uh, relevant. It's, it's also something we are still will be working on over the coming um, coming two months until the end of the projects to make a first uh, proposal for such guidance in the project. Um, and of course, any other ideas of how to move from here are very uh, welcome. So thank you. With that, I would like to give the floor. Back to Philippe. Thank you, Peter, for this nice recommendation. I hope you all have taken notes because now we will ask you to react on that later during the Q&A session. Now we will start the first session. The first session, as I was mentioning, is to have a project licensing national overview. And uh, we will start with Fausto Battini, the chief Technology Officer of Magma Energy, a project developer in Tuscany, for presenting uh, the case study of Italy. And then we will have Paul Bonnet Blanc from the French Ministry to present the situation in France. Anna Maria Nador from the Geogod Survey of Hungary, presenting the situation for Hungary. And Elga Ferket from the VPO, so the Flemish uh, Authority to present the situation for Flanders and the case in Belgium. So first of all, we start with you and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Philippe. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, my presentation, uh, uh, which will dealing with the status of and uh, challenges of uh, uh, licensing uh, or in Italian, uh, uh, in Italian uh, geothermal development. Uh, this slide show how the was the expectation uh, for development uh, in that 2010 when uh, a new legislation was issued to promote the uh, geothermal development through the opening of uh, geothermal market to new players uh, and uh, simplifying the authorization processes. Uh, so. As you can see in the map, the more than 110, uh, 120 applications for new leases uh, were uh, filed to the different uh, uh, authorities. And uh, as shown uh, in, the, in the diagram uh, prepared by uh, UGI, uh, Italian uh, Union of Geothermal, uh, Geothermal Union, uh, in, in 2010, uh, the, uh, the, the growth of geothermal was uh, quite uh, important, uh, uh, for uh, estimated quite important. So, but of course, uh, uh, one point, uh, critical point, is uh, to have a simply and fast track licensing process, because otherwise it would be difficult to reach the ambitious target. Uh, target. Um, um, Showing in the in the diagram. So regarding the licensing process, uh, sorry, can you see my screen? No. Hello. Yes. 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 We can. Yes, we can see. Oh, I cannot cannot see my screen now. Okay, I don't know why. Sorry, guys, but. I'm not able to see my screen. I don't know why. Try stop sharing and uh, share it again. 
Okay. Well, I, I don't know why. Can you can you restart again or? You are the presenter, Fausto. We can see yeah, you but, and but give slide number three. I see my screen on, the, on my life. Okay, uh, now I have. Uh, I have. Okay, so according to the uh, Italian law, uh, the geothermal resources are classified as uh, shown in this uh, slide. Uh, high temp temperature resources are those uh, uh, with uh, temperature higher 150. Medium enthalpy resources uh, for temperature uh, ranging from 90 and 150, and low enthalpy are uh, for below 90. Uh, according to the type of uh, of the resources and the, the size of uh, of uh, the power plant, uh, there are different uh, uh, processes, uh, licensing processes. Uh, for instance, uh, the resource of uh, uh, with uh, size uh, above uh, 20 megawatt are considered uh, as uh, of national interest, so that the uh, authority delegated to release to release the uh, or to manage the um, authorization process are the region or the delegated bodies. Uh, resources of local interest, uh, which are below 20 megawatt, uh, again are in charge of uh, the regions. Resources developed uh, by innovative technologies, the so called the pilot uh, plants, are uh, uh, coordinated, the site licensing process is coordinated by Ministry of Economic Development in agreement with the Environment Protection uh, Ministry and uh, uh, other and the region where the um, uh, resource or the project is located. Uh, so, in terms of uh, ownership uh, of the process uh, coordination and in terms of uh, uh, time lasting for. Uh, the is, 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 um, achievement, uh, exploitation of the lease. Uh, you can see in this table that for exploration lease, uh, the owner of the process is the region, and the licensing uh, is uh, involved the energy department, and it takes uh, about uh, uh, 250, 240 days. Uh, uh, however, also the uh, environment uh, department is involved to provide the environmental authorization or power, which is a, a kind of uh, unique uh, uh, authorization to build the, uh, the um, to, to allow the project to be um, built. And in this case, uh, for exploration lease, the <clears throat> Timing is about uh, 90 days. Uh, however, there is also landscape and cultural aid heritage uh, uh, authorization to to achieve, uh, and this is under the uh, authority of uh, superintendents of cultural heritage, and uh, th this uh, takes about 30 days. So the total time uh, for Acquisition of uh, exploration lease is about uh, uh, 12 months, so one year. For the for the uh, pilot project, uh, instead of the the timing duration, I mean the total duration expected is between 14 and 20 months. While for uh, um, exploitation concession, which are under the uh, ownership of the region, uh, we have a more or less same timing that uh, for um, for a research permit, so about uh, 14 and 20 months. Uh, this is the list of uh, uh, key authorities involved in in the process. 
as you can see, there are many uh, authorities that uh, all have to provide uh, their uh, advice, opinion, and, uh, and remarks on the during the process. I don't go through the all of them, but you will have the opportunity to read uh, when uh, the presentation will be shared. This uh, um, slide show, I mean, try to uh, show the uh in a more simple way what could be uh, the 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 process uh, the main step of the process for licensing the pilot project so that means the owner is MISE, a ministry of economic development uh, there is an application which will require uh, several uh, documents including of course the development plan the work plan and budget uh, environmental study and so on uh, all these documents are filed uh, to the Ministry of uh, Economic Development, which uh, verify the um, um, compliance with the with the with the law. And if every, everything is uh, uh, um, uh, if it, it is accepted, uh, we there is a, a, a step of authorization at the uh, CIRM, CIRM, which is a, a committee uh, for uh, hydrocarbon and uh, mineral resource, which is technical committee, that uh, evaluate the project and establish if the project is viable, uh, is eligible to, to be considered a pilot project. Uh, then the, there is the step of environmental authorization. This process is in charge to uh, MATMA, which is a, a Ministry of the Environment. And uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, we can have uh, different rounds uh, providing integration uh, uh, according to the specific request that can come from uh, the Ministry uh, of the Environment, but also trying to answer many uh, questions uh, arising from uh, other uh, subjects like uh, uh, environmentalist committee or uh, peoples uh, and so on. Uh, once the uh, process of uh, uh, environmental authorization is completed, uh, the opinion and the advice of MIBAC, which is a Ministry of uh, um, Cultural Heritage, is requested and they can provide positive or negative uh, advice. In case they provide a negative advice, uh, since the Ministry of Environment and MIBAC are uh, at the same level, uh, a decision at higher level is needed. So all the procedure is uh, sent to the Council of Ministries. And if the ministries agree on, uh, uh, on the, to, to, in the prosecution of the project, then uh, an agreement with the region will be uh, reached uh, before, I mean, the, uh, uh, the Ministry of uh, Development uh, issue the the permit decree. And once the permit decree, uh, the, the, um, the, the decree for the release of a permit is issued, there is another step, which is to get the authorization to build, uh, to execute the, the, uh, the project. And, and then uh, if everything is going smooth, uh, you can start finally the execution of your project. And you have there will be available between 48 or 72 months to to complete the uh, um, construction and uh, um, uh, testing of, of, of the of the project. So as you can see, the authorization procedure is very complex. There are several authorities which are involved in the process and sometimes are conflicting each other. Moreover, uh, you have to we have to consider that opposition or appeal can be indefinitely extend the appeal coming from uh, uh, any any uh, people who be against the, the 
the project can extend indefinitely the timeline uh, of the process. Having said that, uh, I uh, try to show what is the status of uh, uh, the actual uh, um, project uh, under evaluation uh, at, uh, at, uh, mean, uh, at, for a pilot project. Uh, you see the, the time, so uh, the year, I, between uh, one year to 10 years, the red line, the vertical red line, is a time limit according to the law. And as you can see, all the um, projects submitted uh, for uh, uh, licensing are strongly in delay. Some, in some cases, for instance, uh, in the first case, the Castel Giorgio, uh, once the process was completed, uh, uh, finally, there was a, a, a repeal at the State of Council, and uh, the, the um, decree released by MISE was cancelled. So that means uh, if you want to execute the project, you have to restart from, uh, from zero. And so th th this is a very, very bad situation. As you can see, no one of uh, the project uh, submitted to the in 2011 or 2012 has been uh, has been uh, executed uh, uh, even authorized at this stage so the time needed for lighting uh, is more than uh, the time assigned for the execution of the project uh, opposition of me but the environmentalist committee are not always motivated but still are able to delay or even uh, jeopardize the, the, the project. A different situation, the more easy situation, is uh, uh, occurring at the region, Tuscany region level, uh, where uh, three new concessions, exploitation concessions, were uh, uh, filed. The, the licensing process for exploitation is quite similar to the pilot project one, but as you can see here, uh, while the uh, process for power or environmental impact assessment uh, is quite, uh, uh, let's say, satisfactory, uh, quick, uh, about two years, with respect to, uh, to uh, I mean, the time. Uh, uh, put by, by law, still there are some uh, delay represented by appeal that uh, uh, environmentalist uh, committee can uh, actually did in this case uh, to the uh, TAR, which is administrative uh, uh, trial uh, court. Uh, and uh, even if, uh, I mean, the TAR rejected the uh, appeal uh, again uh, you can uh, make another appeal to higher level which is uh, uh, to state council so uh, i mean uh, it, it's not ending process uh, so it's, it's it's very difficult very tough for developers to uh, to uh, make a, a reasonable business plan to to develop a, a project in the in this in this way I uh, don't go through the other, but they are in the similar situation. Uh, so the, the licensing process uh, is a satisfactory efficient in Tuscany. However, the opposition of immediate again, and the appeals of the administrative coup by environmental committees slow down the process. Uh, I would like to highlight that uh, in most, in almost all cases, uh, MIBAT uh, put opposition, though there are no a uh, reasonable uh, 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 motivation uh, uh, because uh, I mean the, 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 there are no constraints where the the, the project uh, were proposed to be built. So that that's uh, one of uh, the most critical issues. Uh, this is a uh, the flowchart or the main step for uh, uh, acquisition of exploration lease. I don't want to go through uh, too much uh, detail, but just highlighting that when you ask for the uh, surface exploration uh, 
uh, permit uh, or you need to go sometime to two or three uh, for environmental authorization because uh, you need a specific authorization for uh, thermal to slow a little bit the the process in terms of uh, uh, the status of existing uh, leases you see here in this table there are 40 54 leases issued right now with uh, 3252 square kilometer covered uh, by leases in five different regions uh, the exploration work were completed uh, in only few leases due to several reasons first is again uh, opposition of local community uh, suspension of activity for moratoria uh, that occurred uh, both in La Tuscany region and Lazio region. Uh, this moratoria is, uh, uh, let's say, I don't know how we can translate in English, but it's a period where you are uh, 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 denied to execute any uh, field activities. Uh, suspension for definition of a a and I, so areas of no suitable geothermal development in Tuscany. And for some leases, the authorization is issued only for uh, surface surveys, not for drilling a deep wells. And when uh, the authorization for drilling is issued, uh, is uh, uh, released uh, without uh, no assurance to, uh, that the exploitation concession will be granted. So that makes it very difficult to, the, to develop uh, at the industrial level uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, project. So at this stage, only three leases are uh, applied for exploration concession. Uh, final remarks. OK, uh, I think the main crucial issues are some laws, regulation, and directive to be complied with are not always uh, clearly applicable. There is heavy and sometimes unnecessary documentation required for the application, of, mainly for AIA. You must take in account that uh, there are tens of documents and uh, thousands of pages that uh, needed uh, uh, to be uh, submitted for AIA. Uh, overlapping of responsibilities between the authorities involved in the authorization procedures. For instance, the landscape department of the region and the superintendents of cultural heritage, uh, cultural heritage uh, have to give their advice on the same, uh, uh, the same um, topics. Overestimation of some risk and impact in the area and uh, consequently requirement of disproportionate mitigation measures that are going to increase the cost of development. Uh, so what are the proposals? The proposal is uh, to make, uh, uh, to, to, to do the license process more effective. The proposal is to draft uh, a kind of uh, geothermal licenses book, handbook, which collect the best practice and deliver proposal for an European geothermal licensing guideline so that uh, the regulatory framework uh, in Europe could be harmonized. Uh, last but not least, promote education and training event for key personnel of the authorities in charge of uh, licensing process to transfer knowledge and expertise on the uh, geothermal uh, industry sector. Conclusion. Uh, I finish with my first slide. Uh, regrettably, the complex, long time lasting licensing process did not allow the development of expected, expected in 2010. No power plant uh, was built uh, in the last uh, 10 years in Italy. Okay, I finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, this extensive presentation uh, but uh, the Italian cases. We have some questions, but maybe we'll come back to them during the Q&A session after the, the round table. I now give the floor to Paul Bonnet-Blanc to present the situation in France. Paul, the floor is yours. 
can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will uh, give you a, a brief, very brief uh, overview of, uh, of uh, the situation in France. Uh, starting with Sorry, I may make my slide show. Okay, um, we have uh, uh, just to give you um, a brief overview um, of uh, of uh, we we have uh, three different uh, types of uh, which we'll be considering in. Uh, for geothermal energy uh, in our regulatory uh, framework. Uh, shallow, so I will not uh, talk too much about it because uh, I guess that's not uh, the, the, the key point here. Um, and low, uh, which I will refer to low temperature and uh, high temperature uh, later on. But uh, just to explain that uh, very recently, end of uh, uh, 2019, uh, the legislation uh, changed uh, to uh, to accommodate uh, to well our target and the, the, the situation and uh, our knowledge. Um, well, uh, just in terms of uh, of the weight of the different uh, shallow and low temperature, so basically uh, heat pump are the most of uh, of the capacity installed, uh, followed by its uh, production, and uh, then electricity. And these figures refer to uh, mainland France uh, only. Uh, that that was our target in uh, in the past uh, uh, energy roadmap. Um, so lately, we focus on uh, two things. One was the, uh, the simplification of the legal framework, what we call uh, uh, GMI, uh, for shallow and low temperature, trying to streamline uh, permitting. So it was not as a permitting, it was uh, declaration, so not authorization, just a, a mere declaration was, was enough uh, for heat pump uh, below 500 uh, kilowatts uh, installed, and uh, we ha we had a, diff uh, uh, an, uh, a second uh, set of, uh, of rules for uh, so-called heat production, so below 150 degrees, uh, uh, deep geothermal, and uh, the third uh, set of rules was for uh, generating electricity, but uh, let's say uh, for temperature for uh, for resources um, at a temperature above 150 degrees. Um, so the second set of um, evolution in the regulatory framework was aimed to streamline the development of uh, deep geothermal. So the so-called uh, low temperature, so BT and HT, high temperature uh, resources. Of course, I have to mention that we are also a lot working on not only uh, uh, regulatory framework, uh, uh, but which is also part uh, with the aid schemes uh, along with uh, this uh, this uh, framework uh, from the mining code. So basically, uh, I, I won't talk too much about uh, the, the shallow part. Uh, which was uh, uh, reviewed in uh, 2015, uh, and the, the, the with what was reviewed lately in 2019 uh, and published in 2019 and, and enforced uh, beginning of 2020 uh, was the uh, uh, the deep low temperature and deep high temperature. So we we just suppress the uh, the uh, temperature limit of 150 degrees, and uh, instead we had to implement uh, a, a boundary or a limit, uh, which was set to a 20 megawatts uh, thermal, to distinguish between this uh, 
now is not mentioned as low temperature, uh, but rather a, a streamlined uh, procedure and another uh, more complex uh, but more extensive in terms of rights, of mining rights for the uh, the, the uh, resources that uh, that is supposed to uh, to deliver more than 20 megawatts per month. So one uh, is now designed. Uh, the one below 20 megawatts is designed to uh, to harness uh, resources that uh, are better known. Uh, better known in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, we have a, a past history of um, even uh, oil and gas exploration, and uh, and that that uh, that set of uh, of rules uh, will enable to uh, develop projects uh, in less than uh, three years for exploration. So so let's say below 20 megawatts uh, per month. Uh, this is the uh, this is the call um, an authorization uh, for a term, uh, for a licensing for exploration and for production it's it's a, it's a permit. When you you have the resources uh, uh, that is supposed to be uh, the production is supposed to be above 20 megawatts uh, per month, uh, we will run into a permitting uh, exploration permit that. Um, that's an, uh, well, secure a five, up to a five year period, which can be extended twice. So uh, five times uh, three makes uh, uh, the exploration period uh, available for, uh, for 15 years. And, uh, and the, uh, it leads to, uh, uh, if it's above the 20 megawatts, uh, to a, a concession. Which uh, which also uh, differ a little bit from uh, for permit uh, production permit in uh, in the uh, let's let's say so-called simplified uh, uh, permitting procedure. So just a, a quick summary, but we we change from uh, a temperature, uh, and uh, one of the reason was that um, temperature was not known before exploration. Of course, uh, we know in the Paris Basin, the when moon, uh, we aim at uh, 70, 80 degrees, uh, sometimes below, uh, maybe deeper, a little above, but uh, overall it was uh, below 150 degrees. Um, but in some other areas, uh, namely uh, Azaz, uh, east of France, uh, we had temperature close to 150 degrees. And the, 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 the problem was uh, that if you uh, are above 150, uh, you can, let's say, you, you change uh, the regulatory uh, frame, um, context. So if you uh, aim for a permit for 150, above 150, then you discover something that is, 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 something that is below 150 degrees. That will, uh, uh, let's say, alleviate all your uh, your exploration efforts. So, uh, so that was the uh, the drive for 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 change, and uh, and that change occur in uh, and again uh, end on uh, of 2019. Well, it's it's a little bit too uh, difficult to reflect on that, but maybe with uh, some question and some. Uh, uh, we can we can share the, the primary uh, the primary uh, conclusion of uh, of uh, this uh, change. And again, um, that was also uh, because the exploration was a little uh, more difficult in areas where uh, you can produce it. That we change and we allow this uh, long range uh, permitting procedure to address the resources below 150. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of um, the status of exploration, it's, it's dated, but that's uh, that are the former uh, low temperature or so simplified procedure uh, permitting in uh, in area of France. So you see east I mentioned earlier and the Paris Basin, but of course in uh, southwest of France and and some of uh, in the thousands of part of France, but all were aimed at resources below 150 uh, so that was to uh, to produce it 
Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, permitting uh, referring to the long term permitting uh, procedure, uh, which uh, aim at uh, for mainland France uh, three main areas, uh, uh, what we see as ABC. But uh, the more active where uh, drilling occur was in the Alsace region, in the Rhine Basin. Uh, of course, uh, historically, uh, the, the, the power production was in the overseas department and uh, in the grad loop, where the permitting is the same, but uh, in terms of uh, financial incentive and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, um, the electric produce and the feedback tariff are, are, are different, but the regulatory uh, aspect are the same. So most probably you will see mainly a uh, long long term permitting procedure for overseas department uh, because well the uh, geological complex is uh, is uh, is uh, in primary uh, uh, more uh, a little bit difficult to to tackle. Um, just to mention well uh, the fact that uh, I made in the introduction but. Regulatory uh, aspects are, are important, but uh, uh, funding and, uh, and subsidies are also important. Um, as an, at the national level, uh, I just uh, make a focus on this uh, produce. Uh, it's not properly interlinked with the uh, regulatory framework, but at the same time, uh, we have consideration and more accurately uh, now with the new legislation, uh, that went into force uh, beginning of 2020. Uh, that uh, we consider also the bankability of the project, and the bankability means also that uh, we have to consider uh, the part of the subsidy. So uh, the heat fund uh, is an important part, and also uh, we uh, we uh, we have uh, uh, we have a strong effort also on the mitigation fund. Uh, to cover geological risk, and this is all part and is, is considered not in the legislation itself, but uh, the way we appreciate project, and that's something I want to raise. Um, well, this is uh, just uh, just a, a wrap up slide, and uh, well, of course, open to questions, and, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paul, for this uh, presentation for the French KG. As I say, we will have some questions and answer session later, so we will come back to some questions for you, Paul. Now I'm giving the floor to Anna Maria Nador to present the case studies of Hungary. Anna Maria, floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, or sorry, good morning to uh, everybody. So I would like to give a, a short overview on the licensing of deep geothermal projects in Hungary. However, I will not go for a full detailed overview because that, that would uh, take a lot of time. But instead, uh, my approach was that if you look at, and I think this is, this is true for each country, if you look at the geothermal conditions of a given country, it of course defines what kind of relevant environmental impacts a geothermal project might have. And of course, this also determines what are the main areas of uh, legislation. So in the case of Hungary, you know, Hungary is situated in the center of Europe, surrounded by Carpathians, Alps. So this is a huge sedimentary basin, basically with low enthalpy resources. So the outflow temperature is, yeah, the average is uh, between, let's say, 60 and 100 Celsius, which also determines the type of use. So there is a huge number of thermal water wells in Hungary, as shown by this uh, little map. Nearly 1,000 active thermal water wells are producing thermal water, which means that uh, the outflow temperature is considered to be higher than 30 Celsius. So this is considered thermal water in Hungary. And if you look at the, the type of use, it's uh, roughly one third of the installed capacity is used for balneology. About one third uh, is used in the agriculture for direct use. So there are a lot of plastic tents, uh, greenhouses heated by geothermal, especially in the southern part of Hungary. And about one third is used for district and space heating. 
but uh, this geological setting and this type of uh, utilization also determines that the majority of the thermal or of the geothermal energy production is happen is happening with the abstraction of thermal water so more than 15 million cubic meter per year is abstracted from deep lying carbonate reservoirs and about 40 million cubic meter per year from the basin fill sediments, so from porous sandstone uh, aquifers, which, uh, which clearly implies that most of the impacts uh, regarding the use of geothermal energy in Hungary are related uh, to, to different kinds of water management, water protection uh, aspects especially if we consider that unfortunately uh, the reinjection of used thermal waters uh, is very very small uh, in Hungary and most of the used thermal water is, is left uh, on the surface. So if we look at the, the regulation in Hungary, uh, this is a typical problem which was also highlighted uh, by Peter in his summary, the geothermal energy has a dual regulation in Hungary it is both under the scope of the Mining Act and also under the scope of the Environmental Protection and Water Management uh, Act. So geothermal energy or thermal water, uh, it's uh, differing which, uh, which act we are looking. Uh, in both cases, this is a state-owned uh, natural resource. And while the Mining Act is, cons is especially focusing on the energy content of the thermal water and defines geothermal energy as the internal heat of the Earth, the Water Management and Environmental Protection Acts are looking actually with the carrying medium of the energy, the thermal water. And uh, besides this uh, dual regulation, what further complicates the licensing and the whole situation in Hungary is that uh, in 2010, by the modification of the Mining Act, the so-called concession system was introduced. And it considered that uh, below the depths of uh, 2,500 meters below the surface, the entire country is closed and for the exploration and exploitation of geothermal energy and it can happen only in a concessional system. But I have to emphasize that this 2500 meter is an, is an absolutely artificial boundary with very little, let's say, geological background, so it, it uh, initiated a lot of discussion. But anyway, this is, this is the, still the case in Hungary. However, uh, before any geothermal project uh, can start, the first step is to get an environmental uh, license uh, for the project, if this is, this is necessary. And uh, this uh, environmental, uh, preliminary environmental permit is issued by the, by the environmental authorities, so these are, these are governmental offices who are involving in the licensing process the, the special relevant authorities, so water, authority, water management authorities, land and soil protection, mining authorities, uh, and so on and so on, to, to have to issue this uh, permit. And the, the uh, procedure of this environmental uh, permitting or environmental impact assessment is actually regulated in a, in a special governmental decree. But I have to emphasize that this is, like also in the other countries, is, is, is a very general description of the procedure. And there are only a few specifics mentioned in this, uh, in this uh, regulation, which are related to geothermal. Namely, that uh, it has to be an environmental impact assessment has to be performed if the geothermal power plant uh, is above the 20 megawatts, if the project is within the protection zone of some mineral or medicinal or drinking water resources, is within a, a natu uh, Natura 2000 area, or again, and here I'm coming back, how the how the role of groundwater is, is emphasized in almost all regulation in Hungary. It also sets a limit. So if thermal water abstraction uh, exceeds 500 cubic meter per day from uh, karstic or 2000 cubic meter per day from 
porous uh, geothermal aquifers, then an environmental impact assessment has to be done. Uh, regarding the the authorities and the licensing procedure, as I said, this 2,500 meter is a, let's say, a not very lucky, but uh, an artificial uh, boundary uh, for also for licensing, which exists in Hungary. And uh, it also splits the regulation and the procedures, licensing procedures in two, two totally uh, different directions. So if somebody wants to have a geothermal project, a well, uh, which is uh, above, so which is less uh, deep than 2,500 meter and want to abstract thermal water, then uh, the company can do it based uh, on a simple water license. There are different types of licenses, water licenses, but it's, it's uh, too detailed for this presentation. All in all, these water licenses are uh, issued by the, the, the water management authorities who are actually re the regional directorates for disaster management in Hungary. So this is quite simple. However, if you want to go deeper than 2,500 meter, then it can be done only in, uh, on the basis of a, of a geothermal concession. A concession which also, uh, of course, exists for hydrocarbons in Hungary. This is uh, valid for 35 years and this is an absolutely open tender. So once a concessional a geothermal concession is uh, advertised, this is also in the EU official journal. And the exploration <coughs> of the concession uh, permit, the exploration permit for the concession is issued by the mining authorities. And once uh, the exploration is over and it is confirmed that yes, there are real good resources and the operation should start. Before the operation starts, a so-called uh, geothermal protection zone, which is a kind of 3D mining plot for the deep geothermal resource, so a subsurface protection zone has to be set up based on the uh, numerical hydrogeological and heat transport models. And uh, this is, I think, a good practice that this is a, a really, a, let's say, scientific work. And this is done by the, by the Geological Survey of Hungary. So this is the designated organization to do this uh, protection zones by the law. And however, when the production starts uh, from, from the depth, then, of course, the licensing, uh, official licensing, main licensing body is the mining authority. But however, if it happens together with the production of some deep fluids or so some water, then the water management authority is also involved in the licensing as a kind of co-authority. Uh, if you look at this map on the slide, then actually there are two active geothermal concessional areas in Hungary, which are indicated by the, the red colors. There is one uh, area uh, more or less in the middle of the country here, uh, Jászberény area, where the exploration has been done. And all the other areas, the pink areas, uh, are the areas for the so-called uh, a kind of preparatory study for concessions, but I will I will uh, talk about uh, on this next slide. So also according to a, a special legislation on the concessional areas before exploration and anything starts, a so-called complex vulnerability and impact assessment uh, has to be done, has to be performed. And the aim of these studies is to determine those areas where uh, mining activity cannot be performed due to any kind of environmental, nature protection, water management uh, aspect, public health, national defense, and so on and so on. So these are really very detailed studies which make a very complex geological, geothermal, and also environmental kind of pre-screening and study of the area, which will be in the future tendered for, for concession. 
and uh, so this is done for each uh, each area before it is it is uh, tendered for concession and these studies are are all publicly available unfortunately only in, in Hungary now a little bit uh, more uh, about the the impacts of geothermal projects on groundwater and the links between geothermal energy production and, and groundwater management uh, issues. So as you all know, uh, in Europe, the main uh, overarching rule is the Water Framework Directive. And uh, within the Water Framework Directive, each country has to done a so-called river basin management plan, which is a general countrywide water management uh, work which has to be updated uh, in each six year uh, and in Hungary for the for the groundwaters so the different so-called groundwater bodies which you can consider that these are like uh, hydrogeologically related aquifers uh, we have altogether uh, eight porous thermal groundwater bodies which are indicated by the yellow on this on this map so these are the big porous geothermal aquifers which which store thermal water with a temperature higher higher than 30 celsius and there are 15 karstic thermal groundwater bodies uh, indicated by this red uh, hashed areas which store again thermal karst water in deep lying uh, aquifers and within this uh, river basin management plans uh, what uh, has to be assured that the good quantity status and the good quality status of all these aquifers is maintained. So what does it mean? The good quantity status means that the annual abstraction rate does not exceed the available resources. The abstraction cannot exceed a so-called abstraction limit value, so there is no permanent uh, decrease in the groundwater level, no subsurface flow directions take place, and so on and so on. But if you think these are uh, expressed from a point of view of water management, but again, if you think with the, let's say, the brain of a geothermal project developer, these are also the same interest for geothermal projects that the pressure the yield of your reservoir does not drop so that's why i'm saying that uh, it is often said that there is a conflict between water management because they want to protect the resources and uh, between the let's say the energy sector who just want wants to abstract and use all the resources but actually the the background interests are are very similar uh, this is the same for the good so-called quality status. So it means from a groundwater protection point of view that there is no contamination, uh, the measured values do not exceed the threshold values, and of course uh, the temperature is also considered as a, as a quality uh, aspect, so the temperature does not decrease. Again, uh, what is the interest of a geothermal project developer? Of course, it is very much interested that the temperature uh, should not should not drop. So again, there is no real conflict. I think this is just a different uh, way of uh, of expressing uh, the interests of a of a certain sector. Uh, and finally, the last thing I would like to highlight from Hungary is the is the rain injection. Uh, versus the surface discharge of uh, thermal waters. Uh, as I said, this is a very big problem uh, for country, for, for my country, for Hungary, because uh, according to the to the currently to the currently available legislation, uh, it uh, reinjection is not compulsory, but it says that the thermal water uh, abstracted for energetic purposes may be reinjected after the use, but the surface disposal is all, also allowed if uh, there are no real uh, impacts uh, on the environment uh, on, on the surface, or if the capacity of the surface uh, recipient, recipient is, uh, is adequate. What is the most common uh, solution in Hungary? That they let the used thermal waters to these huge artificial lakes on the surface. So you can see one of such lakes in Hungary, uh, in Szentes, which is a major thermal water production 
region in Hungary. But uh, unfortunately, what also happens that the used thermal water is very often illegally let on the surface to flow away into rivers, small streams, and other recipients. And this is a problem uh, from the environmental point of view for, for two cases, that it has a huge heat load on the environment. So normally the thermal water which is, which is let flowing away is definitely higher temperature than the ambient water temperatures of 30, 40 Celsius. And the second is that uh, although typical Hungarian thermal waters do not have a very high total dissolved content, but still it can, uh, it can uh, cause uh, pollution on the, on the surface. And of course, from a reservoir management point of view, it is definitely not good for a reservoir if it is just abstracted all the time, but, but not re-injected. So it, it, it really may cause the drop of, drop of yield and hydraulic head uh, in, the, in the reservoirs. So this is all I quickly wanted to uh, summarize about Hungary. As I said, not the whole picture, just picking up some maybe interesting uh, aspects of licensing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Maya, for this. Yeah, it's indeed quite detailed and clear presentation from Hungary. Last but not least, we have a fourth presentation of a country overview. It's going to give the floor to Elga Ferket for presenting the situation in Belgium and particularly in Flanders. Elga, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. You, you see the screen? Yes, but not in foot screen mode. No, okay, it's... I, yeah, I still have to switch. Yeah. So yeah, I will present um, geothermal permitting in Flanders and take it from a perspective that is specific for Flanders. Uh, Flanders is a small region in Europe with a very high space pressure uh, at surface. We are uh, the most densely populated region, but we also have space pressure below surface. Um, we have a limited subsurface space for all the needs that are there. Uh, and since we are not an oil and gas country, we never had a lim uh, an extensive subsurface administration. Uh, coal mining was abandoned in the early 90s and it's only recently that subsurface interest is growing, especially due to geothermal development. Um, we also are a politically complex country with the subsurface competences uh, divided between the regional and federal levels, which each have uh, an independent legal framework and agenda. Um, and with all these complexities and with this limited administrative capacity. We need to be efficient on several plans in the permitting process and that's what I will show and that's why I will start from the geology. Plans of geology essentially consists of a layered cake of a few hundred meters of overburden layers and below we have a hard basement and one small sedimentary basin. And this small basin is the most suitable zone for most of the reservoir applications, also for geothermal, especially the hydrothermal systems. So it's all uh, focused in one small area, in fact. So basically, basically almost all applications, past, present, but also future uh, activities, look into the same area and often to the same geological layer which is uh, a complex geology. We have these different legal frameworks and that's why recently we have started to draft a vision for the deep uh, subsurface and in this area that's not an extra or luxury, it's, it's a need in order to cope with all these uh, demands and uh, complexities. Uh, I added a scale to the figures and so you can see that on only 30 kilometers we have now already three projects in place and one in preparation and you see it's a highly faulted uh, area 
um, sometimes with uh, geological uncertainty, which uh, increases the exploration uh, risks. Um, we have, for example, this gas storage, which is under federal law, while the geothermal developments are under regional uh, law. And in the last years, we were also confronted with induced seismicity, which we did not expect it from beforehand, and which uh, even more complicates uh, the preparation of uh, licensing. This is the general uh, permitting path, which is quite structured and logic. In fact, developers need to get permits in two uh, steps. First, exploration, then exploitation. On top of the exploration or exploitation permit, uh, which gives the legal certainty, uh, you will always need an environmental permit to ensure uh, environmental protection. And we have some specific rules adapted for geothermal. Uh, because I told already we have a limited administrative capacity um, and it might become sometimes quite complex. So the spirit is to get the preparation work done uh, or, or do the, the preparation work, uh, in, have there a, a deep uh, revision and, and to, to spend enough time to do the work good there. To avoid problems later on and make the, com the total of the procedure smoother in fact and faster. So that's the idea that we want to go toward an efficient uh, process where we make optimal use of some key instruments and these are the ones indicated in brown. So we have a work plan, an exploitation plan and a measuring plan. And so the idea is that we are not uh, requesting duplicate work, but that files grow throughout the process. So you start with your initial ID. I want to do a geothermal development, geological studies without permit yet, but you can start drafting the work plan. And this one will grow throughout uh, the process and gets more quantified and with more um, uh, model refinements, and better concepts. Uh, and that's the idea. So I will uh, zoom in on the first step, which comprises several milestones. In order to achieve uh, your exclusive right on a subsurface block and get uh, the legal certainty, you need an exploration permit. Uh, for example, if you want to do a, a seismic survey, you can do that perfectly without a permit, but you might want to wait to get first uh, the legal certainty before spending a lot of money, of course. Um, developers that want to participate in the Flemish insurance system need to have an exploration permit first before they can apply in the system. In any case, you need both permits, the exploration permit and the environmental permit before you can start drilling and testing. And in Flanders, we allow production to start already during uh, the exploration permit, which is standard for five years, but can be prolonged. And the reason is that yeah, you need reliable data and uh, realistic concepts, calibrated models to feed the draft uh, a realistic exploitation plan. Because uh, that one needs to be approved uh, by the government before you can go to step two, which is the exploitation. So sometimes it's better to spend more time over the exploration permit to get everything uh, uh, well argumented and, and realistic before um, you get the exploitation uh, permit. Uh, once so the exploitation plan is approved, um, you also need um, the environmental permit to cover all the new installations in your um, exploitation phase and also all the aspects covered by the exploitation permit. So if you didn't do it already during the exploration, then you need to adapt uh, the environmental permit to cover all these um, 
aspects. And then you can have again the two permits, the exploitation permit and the environmental permit. Um, then we still have this measuring plan. This is not a standard. In fact, it's uh, an extra that can be uh, imposed on top of the normal monitoring, but that's uh, for um, those projects which have uh, shown based on the yearly reporting that they have an increased uh, seismic uh, hazard. Um, I will skip uh, this slide with the uh, general guidelines of the legislation and finish with uh, this one where I come back on the specific situation of Flanders. So it is um, high space pressure also uh, below surface. It means that we will always have to seek uh, for a good equilibrium um, between yeah, defining an efficient subsurface volume limited in three dimension that is on the one hand is large enough to contain the expected influences but on the other hand to be small enough uh, to request only effectively used uh, volume or space because we we have a lot of uh, subsurface uh, needs and if we want to give uh, opportunity to as much as possible activities then we need to be efficient on this point. So a simple box that is not fit with local geology or just a vertical column would not be possible in, uh, in our case. And this means also that for the licensing procedure that we will give um, pay a lot of attention to substantiation of uh, local geological concepts, dynamic modeling, uh, to be able to predict reservoir behavior and potential interferences with neighboring projects, because this could even become a showstopper. If you're next to, for example, a federal project, you're confronted with different um, uh, legal frameworks. And so we as Flemish authorities cannot uh, interfere in this, uh, in this risk. Um, also positioning of doublets and geomechanical analysis due to this uh, seismic uh, hazard are important. And yeah, all this means that um, it, it can become a little bit uh, time consuming uh, in the beginning, but it will pay off later on. I said that most activities are um, focused in the same aquifer, and I forgot to say that this layer is uh, a fractured and folded limestone that is locally even karstified, and so with a lot of heterogeneity. And uh, this means that yeah, we cannot do copy paste between projects that we have really case by case evaluations. And uh, so. Um, in the previous uh, presentation, some timelines. In principle, with all this together, and if we try to be uh, efficient and communicate good between the authorities, I think it should be possible to get all the permits done in one year. So that was it, basically, for Flanders. Thank you, Elgar, for this indeed a complementary presentation with different uh, topics in it for Flanders. Um, so I think with that uh, last presentation, we end the first session presenting an overview of the national situation. And now I will give the floor to Peter for managing the roundtable discussion with new panelists. So Peter, the floor is yours. And uh, if you have asked and uh, raised a question, I repeat that we will tweet that in the last session of Q&A. Peter, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, yes, thanks uh, again for, for all these interesting presentations. May I ask the panelists to um, put on the camera? <clears throat> okay, so I see uh, six faces um i think uh, mr osturk is, is maybe not available 
Tu veux yeah, Apocalypse? Sorry, Paul, uh, Paul Bonnet Blanc, I can't. I, I don't have a webcam on my, um, on my computer okay. right now. Yes, okay, that is clear. Okay, well, um, yeah, so, so thank you very much for, for all these interesting presentations. Um, so um, let me get back to, to the idea of, of the main question. So I, I thought for this round table, it would be nice um, to first have a, a round of, of those who have not had, had the chance yet to, to react. I see kind of two main topics um, that might be interesting to explore. There might be others, of course. Um, we have a, one of our recommendations is this idea of a one-stop shop. I think it recurs a lot in the um, in, in the different presentations also. Uh, that's complexity uh, partly related to, to, to the communication among different, say, environmental domains, different departments and so on. Uh, but I do, I do see that as a more like a long-term thing. I mean, this is uh, for sure not something to organize uh, overnight. Uh, the, the other topic would be the um, the guidance. I mean, guidance is, is much more of a short-term thing. It, it, it can be delivered uh, yeah, more, more easily, say, than restructuring uh, permitting processes themselves. <clears throat> what I do think is an interesting topic there is to look into to what extent uh, <clears throat> it is feasible to, to say, to, to have a European level type of guidance, which is still really reflective of all these specific specific elements that we see at uh, at national levels um okay but having said that uh, maybe i would like to give the floor to um, mrs shopka um, to basically i would say to to have a first reflection on what do you think are the main takeaway from the recommendations and, and what do you think would be interesting next uh, steps Uh, I think you're still muted. Okay, now I am unmuted. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, I was, um, uh, forgive me the question, am I supposed to give a presentation or, or only react to um, the, because <laughs> I was asked okay. to prepare a presentation, but uh, uh, well, uh, it seems that uh, it certainly is very interesting uh, on my, uh, from my perspective sitting here in the uh, ministry in Iceland to hear that um, this one-stop one shop model that we uh, have is uh, of great interest uh, to people and is something to aspire towards. And I do think that that is, uh, uh, is certainly something that has uh, had um, has helped a lot in uh, the um, uh, in the concession and in the licensing uh, field here in Iceland. And it seems that um, we have been able to come up with a uh, regulatory system here that is uh, quite um, that is quite uh, efficient. But uh, my expertise actually lies within the um, sort of, uh, I almost want to call it the, the pre-steps to the uh, National Energy Authority uh, issue. So, uh, or their uh, mandate, I should say. So we have this, uh, this tool, this regulatory tool in Iceland called the Master Plan for uh, Nature Conservation and en Energy Utilization. And uh, that is, uh, uh, that's basically, um, uh, I almost want to call it a prequel to the uh, uh, to the licensing uh, process, as uh, as you have been describing it in your countries, where you take individual uh, power plant options or or mining operations, as as one was uh, describing it, uh, and uh, and license that particular um, uh, project. Uh, and so um, I wonder if. Uh, uh, well, the reason that we have this prequel, so to speak, was uh, in order to uh, uh, to try to reconcile opposing views on uh, power uh, exploration in Iceland and on power development. And uh, it was not immediately clear to me from the presentations that were given here whether there has been a lot of uh, societal uh, uh, debates about the uh, energy uh, uh, about these energy options, I should say. And maybe that is a different story now, because uh, in light of um, 
climate change, we all uh, there's this pressing societal need to change the energy uh, sources that we use, and so we might not expect perhaps today to find a lot of uh, social uh, opposition to uh, the um, uh, to these um, energy projects. Uh, but uh, as I said, the the uh, conditions in Iceland were such uh, 15, 20 years ago that uh, there were heavy uh, debates about where to construct uh, our uh, renewable energy uh, options, uh, hydropower plants, um, geothermal power plants. And so they came up with, uh, the politicians came up with this master plan where they sought to do an integrated analysis of all the power options in the country and uh, figure out uh, where it would make sense to uh, construct and develop uh, these uh, power options. And um, uh, that is perhaps, uh, that's, that's an experiment that we have done. It's also been done in uh, Norway, for instance, and uh, that might be of, of interest to, uh, to other countries that are now embarking on this route uh, where, you, uh, where you want to utilize natural resources to an unprecedented uh, degree. And um, so I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, I think that it might be uh, interesting, uh, perhaps at a later point, to, uh, to look into that from, for, for you all who are now uh, starting this journey. Does this make sense? <laughs> Peter? Yes, um, for sure. That's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, for the uh, master plan, maybe, uh, maybe Fausto, you could, uh, react to that you you mentioned also in your your presentation sometimes uh, opposition that would that also leads to delays in, in licensing so do you think that working with something like the ma the master plan could could help um, that perspective yes uh, the master plan uh, um, or a kind of master plan uh, for instance is already in place in Italy okay uh, where uh, uh, transition uh, green transition plan is uh, under discussion now so um, the um, amount of different uh, the contribution of different uh, uh, resources should be should be discussed but going to geothermal uh, energy i think it's a quite uh, uh, would be quite good to have a master plan for geothermal what i mean uh, for instance i had experience to work in a uh, outside country for instance uh, nicaragua which is uh, i mean not very well developed country but they already have that a master plan prepared by the, the state uh, and the master plan defined uh, what are the area where the geothermal can be developed and according to some geological and geophysical uh, data uh, that were collected in the, the, this country by uh, World Bank and also uh, uh, defining what are the environmental constraint or landscape constraints so in other words uh, should be defined the, uh, uh, the area where the geothermal development can be uh, performed according to the type of resource and also to the limitation of the uh, constraints of uh, environmental uh, constraints now the question is who is going to prepare this uh, this plan because it could be the state national state that uh, have um, money uh, and resources to uh, collect all this information or uh, could be the private company delegated uh, to acquire this information but you know uh, what is occurring in Italy, as I try to explain. Uh, uh, we we had, uh, I mean, more than 120 uh, application for exploration lease. But then, when you go in the field, uh, when you go to in the local community, you you find, uh, I mean, strong strong uh, uh, reaction against uh, your activity, and so you are 
obliged to stop most of uh, of the exploration work that you planned. Um, so I think this is an open question. Uh, okay. Would you like me to com comment on this, or well, just to to get back to the um, uh, to the one-stop shop uh, option? Maybe you can just reflect or or just um, explain a little bit how how this 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 uh, way of organizing the permitting uh, process came to life, so to say. Um, and then and then in, I would like yeah. in, in in your country in Iceland, mm -hmm. um, and then then I think it would be interesting to to have also a perspective, say from from Belgium and France, for example, like whether there is also from that side a need, uh, and and how we we could possibly work in in that direction. Uh, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm not uh, in a position to answer your question about how this one-stop shop uh, model came to be. I honestly don't know. <laughs> that's that's a very uh, honest answer. But, um, uh, well, maybe it, it has to do with uh, the fact that uh, governance in Iceland and uh, institutions uh, have been, uh, well, they've, I guess we've tried to keep them simple because we're simply a, a, a small country with limited resources. So it hasn't really made sense to uh, have this uh, distributed all over the place, and uh, also it has been uh, a um, it has been a priority, I think, for uh, politicians throughout uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years or so to try to simplify the process in order to make it uh, in order to uh, deliberately facilitate uh, licensing issues in geothermal and uh, hydropower. I think uh, because we've all recognized that this, uh, that being able to utilize these resources here in Iceland uh, is extremely important for us, not least economically, because we, uh, it's, it's a huge uh, savings for us as a nation, not having to import uh, uh, fossil fuels and coal, coal and oil. And so uh, making all att attempts to make uh, this as, as simple as possible uh, has uh, simply been beneficial for all of us. But uh, there are other people much better qualified to answer your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe, uh, uh, Mr. Brunet, you, you, you would like to reflect how, if, how, what this means, say, for, for, the, for the case in France? Is there a need for, for something like that, would you say? And... Um, so, Mr. Bonnet Blanc, are you uh, there? If if not, I would like to give the floor to uh, to Helga. C could could you reflect on what this could mean for a Belgian context? Of course, there are some specific specific situations where we have uh, the federal and the, and the regional levels, um, and so on. But yeah, yeah. In fact. Uh... I think we have quite a one-stop shop where it concerns the environmental aspects because you do only one application and everything is behind. You don't see it if you apply, but it's organized that yeah, for the the, the contractor, uh, you, you just go to one to one stop shop, let us say. But I wanted to comment that that's only for the environmental aspects. You cannot expect that all the permitting issues are grouped into this one shop because you have different concerns that should be independently guaranteed. Like I'll, I um, mentioned, you have the legal certainty and all these aspects like strategic development, energy, financial, that's what is in the Mining Act. And then secondly, you have the environmental protection and these are not allowed to be mixed up. And most of the time, this is very uh, different authorities in most of the countries. I think it's even different departments. And this is like a separation of power or something. And you should have them both guaranteed, but independently. And I think it doesn't matter when you have only one resource to develop in your country, or if the resource is very shallow, because in the shallow subsurface, most of the time, we don't have such a system to regulate. But when you have to compete between gas storage 
hydrocarbon uh, exploitation and so on, then you need to yeah to have a regulation that says you have this concession and you have that concession. To, yeah, to be precise. So I think it's a perfect idea, and we are already growing towards that model, but only for the environmental aspects and not for the other ones. Mm -hmm. May Anybody I want to react to that? May I react on this, Peter, from Hungary? Of course. So uh, I think it very much depends how this one-stop shop uh, works in reality and what is the what is in theory. Because in Hungary, there was a strong aim from the government to make the the entire public administration uh, more transparent, more cheap, more efficient. So there was a major reorganization in 2015. And they established the so-called regional, uh, what was the name, that uh, regional governmental offices. So for, for each not three, one such office. And, to, uh, and they integrated all the former authorities, so the environmental, the nature protection, the mining, the construction, so all the thematic authorities into these uh, regional offices. And they said uh, we established the one-stop one-stop shop system, which is which is true because if somebody is applying for a permit, then you just have to submit the permit or or the request to this regional governmental office. So from the project developer point of view, this is really a one-stop shop. However, the downside of this big integration was that uh, first of all, a lot of ex experts uh, were lost. So once they merged the different organizations into one department, then of course a lot of people left. So there is a huge lack of competencies on one hand. And on the second hand, the different thematic fields are still existing. So it means that it's still an, an application still has to be uh, reviewed or assessed from different points of view, like environmental aspect, oil protection, mining, whatever. But in not in theory, but let's say uh, from the outside area, this is this is a one-stop shop. But it it did not really solve the problem. So that's uh, what I wanted to add. That it's there is one thing that what exists in the regulation, and the second uh, that how things happen in reality. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Uh, yeah. This is Paul. Uh, sorry, I had problem with mute. Uh, just uh, maybe I can comment if I have uh, one minute. Please do. Please do. Yes. Um, okay. And uh, just uh, to give you um, <clears throat> the, well the situation in France, um, what makes uh, obstacle for one stop shop is um, uh, they have uh, two further dimensions. Uh, uh, to to overcome one is the um, the local and national uh, aspect. So uh, in terms of licensing, sometimes uh, it's it's uh, we we are dealing this at the national level, and uh, sometimes it's at the local level. One uh, the the one I mentioned for the uh, simplified, and uh, so so let's say that's something we we inherited from the past. Uh, more than uh, let's say 100 years, uh, of course not for geothermal, but uh, partly for geothermal and other resources, uh, especially oil and gas. What I mean by that is the uh, everybody is uh, aligned with this. So, so if this is a this would be a, a, a many difficulties to overcome and to let's say uh, uh, merge uh, national and local uh, prerogative, and and that's. Uh, uh, that's difficult to uh, to anticipate now, and uh, but we, still we we are working on this. And and uh, as you as you uh, can imagine, uh, local are, are are doing some part, and national are doing the other part. So and and they are complementary. So so sometimes it's difficult not to deal with this uh, two uh, uh, this two uh, two aspect of this uh, dimension. The other thing is uh, when you think about it, we, we talk about uh, licensing, uh, but there is another department dealing a lot with what's going on in a geothermal uh, or any resources is, uh, uh, is, uh, is a work permit. Uh, well, we would call it like this for, for France. 
but work is a, is another and it's a necessary step and it's um it's something built by um, uh, um, a department called uh, uh, risk prevention so it's more environmental aspect and also this is uh, difficult to um, uh, merge these two aspects uh, licensing and work we we are doing this in the, the simplified uh, exploration permits will will automatically lead or, or let's say in, in intertwine with the work permit or the drilling permit sorry uh, more more accurately is, is the drilling permit so it's it's uh, it's faster but at the same time we are not let's say dealing with the same information that like just uh, giving licensing and uh, secure the mining rights and at the same time giving the permit so again to summarize is a uh, is a one-stop shop uh, shop is is for us is uh, uh we still have uh, uh the local national aspect of things and also licensing and drilling permit and and that we are trying to let's say to uh uh to manage and to uh to uh to improve in in in, in the french context okay thank you very much um yeah also in view of the time i think it would also be interesting to uh, to discuss a little bit about the um the, the idea of guidance. So we, we have addressed a number, kind of a, the best practice guide we see both for licensing, uh, for uh, uh, for for env environmental impact assessment specifically, uh, having more insights on best available techniques. Uh, maybe Thomas, you want to uh, comment on, on on that element, also from a European perspective. Yes. So thank you, Peter. Um, so indeed, uh, I mean, what we we have seen today is that clearly uh, for for geothermal project the, the framework is a, a little bit more complicated, let's say, than uh, than it could be because it's really standing at the intersection of many different permitting licensing uh, frameworks. So you have to to make sure you comply with environmental regulations. You have to apply for mining permits. You have to uh, apply also. Uh, for energy permits, uh, typically connecting to, to the grid, etc., which is also an additional layer, which makes um, everything a bit more complicated. Um, at the European level, um, there has been some effort to try to streamline a bit this process for renewable technologies. Um, the Renewable Energy Directive proposes that uh, there is a framework that is uh, as streamlined as possible with a as simple as possible uh, an administrative process with one or more contact points so it's not quite establishing a one-stop shop for, for technologies but it, it is moving towards uh, that um, also one interesting element of the, the European framework is putting a two-year uh, limit on the permit granting process uh, so more for the uh, energy permitting and the, the mining permitting dimensions uh, but not including the environmental uh, regulation uh, uh, this application so this could be a, a framework that is uh, also better integrated we will have a, a review of the european uh, um, uh, re well, the european climate energy framework coming up in june so that might be uh, something where the conclusions from the, the joint project might be applied to have a framework that is uh, most suited to really bind together the environmental uh, regulation parts and uh, the application of uh, energy regulations. Uh, we have also seen things moving a bit already in this direction with uh, better integration of planning uh, for uh, energy projects in the renewable energy directive, etc. So this is uh, uh, already an evolving framework, and uh, I think uh, the uh, uh, yeah the the NV conclusion will be uh, uh, quite important in that regard. Uh, yeah. I... Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there any other uh, reaction to to the um, uh, idea of developing a guidance? Well, what do you what do you see as the main needs um, from, from your perspectives? Maybe Fausto, you can comment uh, some more on that. 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, the idea that uh, about is to uh, start from uh, the collection of uh, experience gathered uh, in different countries from different operators in order to uh, highlight what are the main issues, main critical, what are the, what is the critical part that uh, um, um, let's say uh, don't allow to 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 get uh, I mean uh, in a short time the uh, the the permits uh, it would be important to define at the European level uh, at the national country level to establish a maximum time for the uh, uh, the exploitation of the completion of the procedure because uh, as I show in my presentation this morning you, you cannot uh, spend uh, 10 years in the permitting phase uh, uh, in order to before to uh, build uh, I mean a power plant which takes place of uh, four years and then uh, only two years for to, to do the your uh, 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 experimentation. So, I mean, the timing uh, for permit should be strictly limited, as well as the uh, um, the remarks or comment or um, uh, observation coming from the external uh, people, like uh, environmental committees or other, should be limited to one shot instead for instance in italy you have uh, uh, one two three rounds of uh, observation that uh, so that you are obliged to answer any specific uh, topics and sometimes you receive uh, tens of, 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 uh, of such kind of observation so uh, and another important point uh, is to have uh, uh, one uh, leader of the licensing process. So you cannot have uh, three leaders, for instance, like occurring in Italy, so Ministry of Economic Development, Ministry of Environment, and Ministry of uh, Ethical Cartilage. So these uh, three subjects are at the same level. So at the end of the process, uh, there will be one that uh, have to take the lead and make the decision, yes or no, okay? So restructuring the uh, organization, I mean, uh, the, the, the process of uh, of the permit and pro uh, of licensing it will be mandatory, not only for Italy, but I think also for other countries. And so joining together, uh, changing the experience, uh, we can come up with a uh, reasonable proposal and recommend to be adopted at the European level. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I see Mr. Osturk and, uh, also joined. I, I wasn't exactly sure if you already were listening uh, before, uh, but um, thanks for, for joining. We are really approaching the, the end already of the, of the webinar, but uh, yeah. uh, please. Uh, uh, I, I, am, I am really sorry for reaction. all audience. I am really sorry for the audience, but I try to catch up for all of the, you know, uh, attendees' thoughts. Also, mm -hmm. I, uh, in four or five minutes, I would like to brief uh, current situation in Turkey and uh, how we can, you know, accelerate the uh, permission uh, in Turkey. May I? E yes, please. Try to thank keep you. it uh, in a few minutes. Yes, thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good evening. First of all, I would like to inform you about current situation in Turkey. The, um, you know, demand for energy and natural resources has been increasing due to economic and population growth in Turkey, except 2020 because of the pandemic. The pandemic has coincided with a time of intense construction activity in respect of existing renewable projects. The project owners were under significant time pressure since the construction needed to be completed before the end of 2020 for such projects to benefit from the feed-in tariff mechanism. However, announced, 
on 18th of the September 2020, the commissioning deadline for benefiting from the current feed-in tariff uh, extend to 30th of the June 2021. Besides that, over recent years, Turkey has experienced the fastest surge in energy demand among OECD countries, according to International Energy Agency forecasts. In meantime, specifically, total share of geothermal resources in electricity production has found 3% in Turkey. The capacity installed with the geothermal power plants reached 1,638 megawatt with a total of 58 plants in operations. According to our Turkish Geothermal Power Plant Investor Association, also I am the Secretary General of that organization, our target for 2023 is to have an installed capacity 2,200 megawatts. So, um, according to you know values and principles in Turkey, uh, how we can manage you know the uh, how we, co we how we coordinate between different responsibilities and authorities be improved in the future. In Turkey, several different authorities have roles in the authorization and approval process in licensing procedures. Environmental impact assessment report from the Minister of Environment and Urbanization, Kadasla records from the Minister of Environment and Urbanization. Also nearly, more or less, 41 authorities you need to take permission. In order to facilitate, facilitate the administrative, administrative task, reducing the task time scope and avoiding duplication, uh, among other considerations, the following rules should be taken into action. Necessary requirements to install new renewable energy capacity must be re-examined and redefined with a focus on optimizing the necessary control and ease of doing business. Stakeholders who grant the permissions should be redefined with an optimization focus and should be enabled to share a common database relevant for the renewal permits. The database should be accessed and used by the licensing authority and the transmission system operator at the very least. A one-stop shop to manage all the system operator at the very least. Also, one-stop shop management, organized permits, license, and authorization necessary to install new power capacity should be established. A re-engineering study for the administrative activities should be conducted with a focus on both enhancing the IT infrastructure for the smooth and fast operation of the permitting procedure. Information and document requirements from different administrative bodies should be optimized. A time frame must be set to manage different administrative tasks, no more than a three-month period for each step. And the total licensing procedure no more than one year. A positive administrative silence should be established in case of no response to application would be automatically authorized. So this is the three pillars uh, of the escalate permitting procedure in Turkey or other countries. Thank you for listening to me. I try to you know, cover everything, Peter. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was a <clears throat> quite interesting overview of the different uh, uh, aspects that are playing a role in the different uh, countries that we looked into. Um, yeah, looking at the time, uh, I think I would like to close this panel discussion. Clearly, uh, it's not the end of the discussion uh, overall. This will continue. Um, can I maybe just hand back to you, Philip? I was looking at the questions, but also again looking at the time. Maybe it is better if we. Oh, maybe we can just. Have five more minutes because there are some interesting questions. Maybe we can uh, just raise today. We will not raise all of them, but uh, just show them which are quite uh, interesting for for all of us to tweet. And I think five minutes we can still have them. Um, the one? first one I, I noticed is uh, the one uh, not I believe for Fausto. You have two questions, Fausto, for Italy. Yes. Is how you define the geothermal energy? Because you know, in the renewable energy directive, we have this general definition of uh, geothermal is the energy stored in form of heat beneath the surface of solid earth. Do you have secondary definition, but maybe not only for so maybe in the other countries? How oh, because it's important this definition of geothermal energy. No, the, the definition of geothermal energy is what was also adopted by European direct directive. So the heat 
the energy, the thermal energy uh, stored in, in, in the earth, and then they can you extract using different technologies. So this is the reason why the uh, geothermal energy is also renewable as well as uh, uh, wind uh, and uh, solar. So the, the geothermal energy is uh, what is stored in the earth in, uh, in terms of thermal energy, not as a fluid. The fluid is a, is a vector, I mean, uh, is a media that can extract the, the heat from the underground. Okay. Um, and a question to Mr. Volkan Oskort is a question um, about uh, the new energy law and uh, what about the regulation of the interest after 1st of July? Do you have some news about that? You are muted. We cannot hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. So, also, this is my very first time go to meeting. I'm always using the Teams and the Zoom, but this is the hardest work for me. So, for the new regulation just released uh, end of January 2021, and for the geothermal, more or less, you are going to get 8.6 US dollar cent for five years. Then it's going to be around 8 US dollar cent for the uh, next five years. I mean, feed-in tariff uh, applicable for 10 years. And the new tariff has just started after uh, 30th of June 2021. Okay, thank you for this clarification. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that you need the other question, Peter. Uh, uh, also, some comments and some are, are quite technical, maybe hard to, to, to report uh, today. So, what we can say is I don't know. Um, Elga, Anna Maria, Fausto, Thomas, Volcan, but also Paul uh, on, I don't know, from Iceland, she just left. If you have a final word to, to report, but as we were saying, today is sort of a final end of our, our recommendation as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a group of stakeholders and as representing the sector, we are providing recommendation. It's a round of consultation, so really feel free to come back to us if you have seen uh, uh, any any clarification needed, the presentation from Peter about our recommendation will be available on, on the website. So feel free to to come back to us with any comments you may have. I don't know if one of you has a last word to say. No? Okay, so it seems all is clear for everybody. So I thank you all. What I want to repeat is that we all meet also next week to discuss another topic, which is air quality emissions. And uh, let's see um, how you are considering the recommendation we provide as D&D. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, all panelists, for this good discussion. And I wish you a nice day and see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.